It's time for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for three years has shared with us her decades' research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative and judicial processes in America. And now, here's May. Good afternoon. This is Dialogue Conspiracy, October 14th, 1974. This is program number 166 on program Dialogue Conspiracy. It's May Brussel from Carmel, California. Before we begin the regular part of the show, I want to remind listeners in the Boston area to uh, contribute money to WBUR, those of you that listen to the Dialogue Conspiracy each week. The station is having a fundraising drive and their marathon is soon to begin. It's a listener-supported station and their fundraising drive begins November the 11th. <clears throat> but it isn't too soon to send in your subscriptions and your money. Uh, there are no large corporations sponsoring these FM stations to put up the money, and it's a unique opportunity to get facts and information and programming that you don't get on the ordinary AM channels or the radio stations that are not listener-sponsored. By you contributing your own money towards a program, you get a wealth of information that is not allowed to come to you through other sources. If you want the information, you have to pay for it. I suppose that's the attitude of the government. Uh, it makes it hard for you uh, to get this information unless you put up some of the money, and that's just the fact of life. Uh, you never realize what you have until it's taken from you, and I'm sure this is true in many cities where the FM stations have folded up or have had to stop certain programs that would have been very informative, and then you miss them later. WBAI in New York is always fighting for funds, and they're low on cash. So we have to support these uh, programs and learn something, try to learn something, even if you don't agree with all the ideas, throw them out, give them a chance, and later in a few years or a short time from now, you may look back and have a change of mind about them, but you won't have the opportunity if they're not on at this time. So help them out if you can. I, I want to make another announcement uh, before we get into this. Uh, the realist I didn't announce last week, you can buy them locally at the Thunderbird or the Aries Art in Santa Cruz, the used bookstore in Watsonville, Byers Bookstore in Sacramento. Uh, if you have bookstores that you want me to announce that are carrying it on the program around the country that ha listen to this show, I will. If you can't get the realist in your hometown, write to me and send me 75 cents and I'll send you the SLA article or two dollars and I'll send you the three articles I did write to KLRB Carmel California box 3904 I put in a request two weeks ago for pen pals for prisoners because I'm corresponding with many prisoners and their friends uh, want somebody to write the people that I'm writing to have friends that want pen pals also and I got a response, a very good response, and have set addresses. I've answered those letters. But there's still some more prisoners who want a pen pal, and I want the listening audience to uh, write and tell me that you will become the friend of a man in prison. I have the names of many men who are longing for a friendship. Uh, don't ask me uh, what their color is or what crime they've committed. I don't think these things are of importance. They never were important to me when I started corresponding. And my purpose in writing to prisoners, which I've done for the last three years, was to be a friend and to help them find a friend. And you have to have trust in each other. And some men that are in on the most serious crimes I learned were innocent of those crimes. That's how I got started in this project in the first place. So you may think that one man is charged with murder and it frightens you. And when you get to know this person and learn the circumstances of the case, the district attorney in his town was seeking re-election, so evidence was forged and there was perjury at the trial and the man is sitting there uh, wanting to tell somebody and the family has abandoned him if he has a family and nobody listens to his story. And when you open up the communication between yourself and a prisoner, you're in for one of the most rewarding experiences in your life. You're not helping him as much as you're her as much as you're helping yourself because it takes your blinders off things that you've been led to believe and in order to make this a better society we have to break down a lot of the myths 
in uh, stories that are fed to us by the ordinary chains of command, whether it's parent or teacher or minister or rabbi, we have to break those myths. There are some people who have committed crimes. There are some people that are violent that you can't relate to. They are about one half of one percent of any prison population in California has the third largest prison population in the entire world. So you're in for an education, and if you write to me and give me your name and address and say, I want to make a friend uh, with somebody inside a prison, I will send you the name of a prisoner. I'm answering all my mail here as fast as I can. It's pouring in every week. I'm having a little post office problem of articles of The Realist where people have sent me Money for the articles have been arriving around the country empty. The envelope arrives and the contents has been removed. And it's serious enough that I called the postmaster this week because uh, there is no contents in there. And this is, I consider, a very serious crime. And it couldn't just happen at the other end because they're going to places like Washington, Oregon, Woodland Hills, all over uh, New York, and they're arriving empty. So I put in a complaint, and an inspector may be down here to look over this matter. And even a woman from Pacific Grove called me this week. She sent me a check four or five weeks ago and never got an answer. And I've, I have returned name on every envelope, and I answer every letter or request within a 10-day period. So I'm compiling the letters from people who are not getting what I'm mailing to them, and I'll take it to the proper authorities at that time. Now, a lot of anti-Rockefeller mail is coming in heavy to the Senate. And at the time that Gerald Ford was being nominated, I had reason to believe that he would be part of the cover-up of the Watergate, just like he was in the murder of John Kennedy. And I tried to reach a lot of people, but they wanted to believe so badly that the replacement would be better than Richard Nixon that it was hard to bring up any pertinent questions at the confirmation hearing. And the, the Senate gave Mr. Rockefeller very easy questions. But on the other hand, Senator Howard Cannon, who presided over the Senate confirmation inquiry, said that the mail is coming in very heavy, that he said there's tremendous opposition across the country to make itself felt. And also, uh, Senator Mansfield said tonight that uh, because of Rockefeller giving money to uh, Henry Kissinger and other important persons in New York and into Congress that they may reopen these hearings. So don't complain later and don't write to me and call KLRB or cry over your coffee about what you can do if you haven't made the first steps. Write to your senators in California, Senator Taney and Cranston, and tell them how you feel. If you don't like an international banker becoming president of the United States who has made these excessive profits from slave labor around the world, express your feelings. If you don't like him calling the National Guard and murdering 43 persons with excessive force, and he perjured himself before the Senate hearings, he told things about Attica that uh, Mr. Uh, not Weicker, Senator uh, of Weicker from the New York Times was Wicker, pardon me, was uh, one of the newspaper men at Attica and defended the prisoners and what happened there. And he said this week that uh, Mr. Rockefeller wasn't telling the truth at his own confirmation hearings. And he's making huge oil profits from the contacts that Henry Kissinger is making around the world and opening up trade. Mr. Rockefeller uh, has invested $34 billion in Vietnam, uh, keeping Mr. Thu in office, the puppet, in order for him to make uh, Chase National Bank putting in money and there's huge oil fines over there. And we find the war in Vietnam was for a large commercial project of many oil companies. If you like the country run for the sake of a handful of people, that's fine. If you don't like it, write a letter about it. Uh, Mr. Rockefeller donated 86000 to Mr. Morehouse. Uh, he's buying his way right and left. Morehouse was later sentenced to three years imprisonment for bribery and unlawful fee charges arriving from a New York State liquor scandal. So. Uh, there's one crime compounded by another crime. One man is paid off because of his expenses or ill health, and uh, Rockefeller is supporting these kind of people. You have to decide what you want and express yourself, and I don't think writing one letter will do it. If everybody listening, and I keep saying this, writes five letters every week on Rockefeller for the last three or four weeks and continues for the next four or five weeks, uh, I think that it would make a dent, or at least we should try it. 
Um, there are changes in Washington this week. I see that some things are coming along for the better. Those terrible presidential powers have been curbed. Uh, they were started in 1933 when Roosevelt was president. But Congress now determines a future, future national emergency without subject to a presidential veto. And this bill, this new bill that just passed, the Senate that goes to the House, suspends all but a handful of 479 different laws that could be invoked for the president to declare a state of emergency. That has been passed by the Senate, goes to the House. The head of the FBI no longer is appointed for life. He has to leave mandatory in 10 years, and if he's 70 years old. That doesn't mean much, but at least he isn't entrenched in there beyond that time period, and he, there's another provision that he can be removed by the president if he has done something wrong. The Freedom of Information Act was passed again just this week. Uh, there was a new vote, 349 to 2. A law was passed in 1966 making information more accessible to researchers and for lawsuits, but you can't arbitrarily cut it off, cut off this information anymore. Requests were in there for information on the various assassinations, the Alter his case, the Rosenberg case. They can no longer arbitrarily withhold documents. If they say you can't have a document, a judge ha can look at this material. Now, that doesn't mean we're clear because the Supreme Court turned down the request of James Earl Ray for a new trial, eight to nothing, they turned him down. And then after they turned him down two months later, so the two men that killed Martin Luther King surfaced, <clears throat> the case is being going to court and being investigated in Tennessee now. So the Supreme Court still is the right-hand man of the president. So that doesn't mean much. But then if we do get a judge like a Judge Sirica or some other judge that's on his toes, it could mean that some evidence that is protecting certain men who are dead, like Lyndon Johnson, or men who are out of office, like Richard Nixon, can no longer be locked up. So finally, Congress is waking up. And I harp away every week at things to do, just like uh, the last few months of the last month is a new law against psychosurgery, electroshock, and uh, this was passed two years nationally. It can't be done in any federal prisons. And then they passed the law in California in mental hospitals as well as prisons that there's uh, strict rules now, and a doctor can lose his doctor's degree if he does it. And so these things are being changed. There are a lot of people in this country, still a handful, but a lot of people working on these subjects and getting their heads together and also using the alternative press and the FM radio station to talk about these problems. And I keep suggesting things to do because I am called the eternal optimist. Ben Jones, the researcher, from Texas always calls me the optimist of all the workers because I've always felt that if we got our heads together, we could affect changes. So back in Washington, these th three things were decided just this week alone, and maybe we will have some good news. Um, there are a list of questions for Gerald Ford to answer about the pardoning of Richard Nixon that he'll do next week, and they're hard, tough questions. So people are on their toes back there. The Congress is on their toes. It's never has happened before, not since Lincoln, I don't believe. So if you take an interest and write letters and support these people that are doing these things and say, sock it to them, those are good questions, or I approve of what you're doing, in the same way, if you don't like Rockefeller, they may open this up now and um, express the reason that you don't if you don't like him and let them know back there why you don't. Well, last, last Monday I talked about a subject that I said I would continue this week on the same subject because I think it's one of the most important findings of my research in the last years, one of the connecting links. You have certain clues or certain pieces of evidence and you have to put the connections together. And the connections I'm looking for constantly are the connections of the SLA. Well, it doesn't exist anymore, but the creation of the SLA to national bombings, kidnappings, violence to our domestic intelligence military agents. Because as you know, I believe the SLA was the CIA and that this group was formed by intelligence agents, uh, maybe using a few well-meaning kids, but created and supplied the tactical support by the police department in Los Angeles and San Francisco and Oakland. And then from there, they could get other groups to instigate violence or hope that they would follow in memory of those that were killed. And I talked about the Eustasi. Uh, those of you who uh, have pencils, write it down again because it's important. 
and I want you to write to public officials about it. The USTACI, the Eustasi, and that is a group of mercenaries, trained soldiers that have been existing in existence since the 1930s, since World War I in Europe, and then were incorporated as part of Hitler and Mussolini's fascism. The headquarters came from Yugoslavia, and I called the Yugoslavian connection because of the connections of Yugoslavians in the John Kennedy assassination, in the bombings in Los Angeles, the bombings in San Francisco, uh, the plans to kill Sirhan Sirhan. I refer to these as the Yugoslavian connections. The Ustasi is not a political party. Uh, make a comparison, say, with the Mafia. It's not a political party. It's a private group. Only in this case, instead of being under the auspices of what you call organized crime, they are... Uh, protected and funded by the CIA and industrialists to spread terror. Their main purpose is to spread terror and bombings, kidnappings, and hijackings in order for the police state to become more efficient and wanted. Uh, I mentioned two men, Mr. Pavlik and Mr. Arturgovic, who ki killed King Alexander in Yugoslavia in 1934, and then were taken to Italy under the auspices of Mussolini and then to Yugoslavia, where they formed a fifth column and worked with Adolf Hitler and ran extermination camps in Eastern Europe. And Mr. Pavelic went to South America. He allegedly went to South America. There's another story that he died in Spain. Mr. Arturgovic is down in uh, California, in Los Angeles, Huntington Beach. And he, there are papers on the desk to extradite him. It, Mrs. Ryan made historic uh, landmark cases last year. The housewife from Brooklyn who worked in the extermination camps, the Nazi a war criminal, was finally exterminated, and it was a landmark case because then maybe these other people can be sent back to their countries where they're wanted as war criminals. Now, the Ustasi are well-funded coming from Canada, and I want to make comparisons tonight between the funding of the Watergate and the John Kennedy assassination, the money coming down from the same places, and I wonder if it could be the same people. Uh, the headquarters for the Eustace has been Argentine, Australia, Latin America, uh, Los Angeles Police Department, I got information, is connected to this. And their recent uh, crimes that I was alerted to was the 1971 bombings in Sydney, Australia, that were synchronized with the 1971 plane hijacking in Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden, that got asylum into Spain and blowing up an airplane over Czechoslovakia where everybody except one person was murdered. The cover story for this group, the Eustasi, is that they're altruistic. This was their story in Yugoslavia. I believe it's the story in America, and that's why the mad bomber, uh, the aliens for America, that he called himself it sounds like he's helping the underprivileged. In that case, he was mentioning the Chicanos. They've been called the Croatian Liberation Movement, and their goal, according to uh, what they say their service is, their goal is to combat crime and political terrorism. Now, that must sound familiar to you if uh, you think of the police force that are out now, say, after the SLA uh, is down. There's new armies, SWAT teams that are set up military teams inside the police departments in this country, in quotes, to combat crime and political terrorism. And it's actually those teams that are the terrorists. They work with the local police department. And I think that we could check out the allegations I'm making on the Ustasi by checking into all the past political kidnappings in America since January of this last year, January 1974. Check them all out and all the... Uh, feed the poor uh, excuse for the kidnappings, including that Mr. Ian in uh, England when uh, the, the allegation that he was going to kidnap the princess, and, and I believe that he's part of this same well-financed team, and they rushed him off to a mental hospital. Then I think we could check out where he got his money, where he traveled. He traveled extensively in Europe and put a few things together. Now, I think there could be an important connection, which I'm trying to make through various documents and work that I'm doing now between the assassinations of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, to the White House plumbers, the Watergate, now the SLA, and the future bombing, violence, hijackings, and assassinations. Uh, if this is true, 
you have to be prepared to say that Mr. Colby, our head of the CIA, and Mr. Saxby, the Attorney General, Mr. Kelly, the FBI, Mr. Bates of the FBI in San Francisco, Attorney General Evel Younger in California, President Gerald Ford, and Attorney General William Saxby, I mentioned him, are all involved. Uh, can a team this big be involved in a conspiracy against people at home like they have been overseas? Well, I don't know. It sounds shocking to say these people are involved in the wave of terrorism that's going to bring the police state. I believe, by the statements they've made and the position they're taking on all these matters, that I do believe they're involved. And it, as I say, there are ways to find out, to check on the background of certain people that have already been arrested. When I had a press conference in 1972 about the Watergate, uh, three weeks after the arrest of the Watergate Hotel, and said it involved Richard Nixon and Patrick Gray and Attorney General John Mitchell and the White House Cabinet, the President, White House aides, White House lawyers, uh, they should all be removed from office. It sounded so horrendous that nothing w was picked up about the press conference on, except the alternative press again, only the uh, Berkeley Bar, the L.A. Free Press, but the major media couldn't handle that all these people, two members of the cabinet, all these people were involved in what we now know as Watergate affair. So now that the Watergate affair is tucked under the belt and we know that a president and his aides and his lawyers and the attorney generals and the acting head of the FBI and the military and the CIA are in fact involved, very much involved, then we have to look at the second team because the same people that were removed from office because of their crimes had the luxury of appointing the second team. And they're certainly not going to appoint people who are going to investigate their past crimes. They have to be part of the same team. That's one reason, but the bigger reason for knowing they're involved is their statements of the SLA and um, the violence and terrorism that's coming down now and the way they propose to handle it. And these are the law enforcement. The way they propose to handle terrorism and violence in the United States is identical to the way John Dean and Richard Nixon and John Mitchell were going to handle the Watergate. And it's just that simple, and their statements reveal that they're all up to their necks in hiding the truth about the terrorism in the United States. I refer to the Yugoslavian connection because I think it's important. Uh, I've mentioned many times Eugene Rangel from Yugoslavia, who's up at uh, San Quentin, who was supposed to kill Sirhan. And I repeat these things now because I want them to sink in. I want to give an example of another uh, Yugoslavian, in addition to Mr. Kerbegovic, who's supposed to be the bomber in Los Angeles. He says he's innocent, the one that came from Yugoslavia to Germany and to Los Angeles. Uh, in addition to those, a typical kind of emigre that is used by the intelligence agency was used at the time of the John Kennedy assassination. Uh, I use an example of a witness called Mrs. Igor Voshinin, V-O-S-H-I-N-I-N. And her testimony is in the president's, uh, the hearings before the uh, commission, the Warren Commission, on the assassination of President Kennedy. Volume 8, page 425, Albert Jenner is asking questions of Mrs. Voshinin. And Albert Jenner was also the lawyer for Richard Nixon in the impeachment inquiry. And she tells how she went to the University of Yugoslavia and Germany attacked Yugoslavia and they ran to the German side because anything as far away from the Russians as they could get they would be. So she was in Germany in 1945 and came to America. And when Mr. Jenner asked her how she happened to get settled here, uh, she said, first of all, we settled in New York. We were taken to the Diplomat Hotel and put there, then went to New Jersey. Then they went to the Greek Orthodox Church in Houston, Texas. This was her testimony in Volume 8. Uh, and I got an idea, see, when I was reading this testimony several years ago, four or five years ago, that this woman and all of these people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area were immigrants that were part of an espionage operation. They'd say, how did you happen to end up in, in Texas? And people like Mrs. Voshinen would say, well, I lived in this country, and then I was in Germany, and uh, then they took us here, and there were too many of us, so they took us there. And you have to say, well, who's taking them? all these places. They're coming over here and how are they getting here? Under the auspices of Reinhard Galen, the Nazi uh, uh, chief of intelligence for Adolf Hitler and the CIA. That's how they came here and about 30 of them settled in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and were the CIA case officers for Lee and Marina Oswald. So Mrs. Voshinen is a typical 
uh, visitor from Yugoslavia to Germany, and she tells how she went to Houston and met there with the head of the Greek Orthodox Church, and then was directed to a George Bowie, she said, who was the manager of the Russian parish, and then to Max and Galley Clark. Well, George Bowie was the CIA officer in Dallas responsible for uh, the, all these emigres that arrived there and gave them place. He lived in the same apartment building owned as a uh, manager owned that Jack Ruby lived in. He lived directly across the street and used the same swimming pool and was directly across from Jack Ruby. And under Jack Ruby was a CIA man who lived under him. George Bowie gave Marina Oswald a hundred dresses when she first arrived so she'd be sure to be comfortable. And the people that he introduced to the Oswalds that Mrs. Voshina knew, this Max and Galley Clark, uh, he was chief of Convair, chief of security for the FBI at Convair in an aerospace industry. This is the web, the can of worms I got into and crossfiled for eight years who these people were. And also, uh, they met immediately George de Morenchild, and Mrs. Voshinen became his secretary. Well, George de Morenchild, his name was Von Morenchild. His family owned the noble oil fields in the Soviet Union when the Russians took over and the Tsar was killed. And he came to America through the intelligence agencies. And he was Oswald's CIA babysitter the whole time that Oswald was in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. De Morenchild was apprehended during 1942 for being a Nazi down at Corpus Christi. The FBI followed him from New York down to Corpus Christi where he's drawing installations. He had a relative that was a Nazi. He, he was the head of the Petroleum Club in uh, Texas and Dallas, and he was praising Himmler and the Nazis. And these are the kind of uh, emigre groups that came from Europe that belonged to the Reinhard Galen organization that were testifying about Leah and Marina Oswald. And I have some of their testimony here I can read uh, or at another time. But this is these people were brought, they were violently anti-communist, they're brought over by the intelligence agencies, placed in the United States, then they are set up with other agents, and they can provide any information you need about a particular witness to make the story look true. And th this is what happens when you want to create a fictitious Lee Harvey Oswald. You use intelligence agents providing the story, and then the medium picks up the story, or these writers like Gerald Ford write a book and say, this is Lee Harvey Oswald, where the book that Gerald Ford wrote after he was a member on the Warren Commission, was made up of witnesses <coughs> like Mrs. Boshinen, who are from the CIA. Now, there are links between um, Nazi Germany, when it first started, to the present-day intelligence in the CIA. Uh, I've run them down many times on the program, but they link to E. Howard Hunt later in Mexico City, and I'll briefly run down some of these connections again uh, this afternoon with you because I think they bear repetition. Uh, a lot of people don't understand how these Nazis got into this country, why the Yugoslavia and Ustazi should link with Nazis or why they were forming our CIA. But after World War I, when Germany was defeated, the military didn't accept the defeat or the Versailles Treaty and the United States businesses felt that they needed a bulwark against communism so they rearmed Germany and the way they did it through was through terrorism and violence and uh, turning the fifth column people against each other so that what you got was a Nazi fifth column of traitors illegally rearming a secret army an intelligence army and they manipulated the elections they did multiple assassinations there were acts of terrorism there were false burnings the famous Reichstag fire and sabotage forgery perjury perversion of the courts every deceit known to man, and it was headed by men like General Reinhard Galen. And at the same time this was going on in Germany, in Yugoslavia, you had the Ustasi, protected by Mussolini, well-trained, sent there to cause the same unrest and bombings and murders and dissent among the citizens in order to weaken the existing government. And the two men, Pav Pavlik and Arturkovich, who killed the king of Yugoslavia in 34 were sent back by Mussolini to Yugoslavia to run extermination camps where they allegedly murdered 80,000, if you can give it a number, but approximately 80,000 they're responsible for. Now, the end of World War II, we needed another bulwark against communism. And men like Alan Dulles, uh, he was a lawyer for the uh, uh, companies that were supporting Hitler, 
was meeting in Switzerland with Reinhard Galen and the Nazis and brought them to this country in order to rearm Germany again and this time to take the third world or the free world because the war was over and all these countries were up for grab. So the Cold War was really a plan to keep the communists from taking uh, over what the imperialists had owned before and the businessmen were terrified of losing their oils, minerals, and slave labor. So we brought home the Nazi general, general and the Nazis into our State Department, our universities, into our military, like a Mr. Winnegar who wrote the Warren Report as the chief historian at the Pentagon, and we incorporated it into our system. We even brought them into the, their, into the Watergate. Men that, that were active in Hitler's army, were in, the testimony came up at the Watergate. If you have the uh, books, the, the hearings before the Select Committee on Presidential Campaign, Volume 11, I've ordered all of them, uh, the hearings of October the 4th, 1973, Senator Talmadge was questioning a Mr. Bentz. Now, Mr. Bentz was a man down in Florida that was hired, paid by Donald Segretti, to disrupt the political conventions, and they also brought chemical to uh, one of the picnics, and they never asked him what the chemicals were for. That's another subject. We'll do it another time. But Mr. Benz was a witness, and he was paid by Donald Segretti. And the money to Donald Segretti came from E. Howard Hunt, whose name runs through all of this. Senator Talmadge said, I believe you had two subordinates. These were men helping him disrupt the conventions. One was named Mr. Duke, and the other one was named Mr. Hearing. Is that right? And Mr. Benz said his nickname was Duke. I don't believe that was his last name. And Talmadge says one was named Duke and the other hearing, and he says, yeah. Now, he doesn't ask what Duke's name is. You see that this man is nicknamed Duke, but the Senate Select Committee, under oath, doesn't identify the name Duke. They're satisfied to talk about a man like the third person is a nickname. So he said, did Mr. Hearing tell you this man, Duke, was a former SS officer for Hitler's stormtroopers? Bent said, correct. Talmadge, do you feel that being trained by Adolf Hitler and his stormtroopers particularly qualified him for the duties that you assigned to him? Benz, I do not know of any training school that would train him for this work. This was to disrupt the conventions down in Miami. Talmadge, were not the activities quite similar? Did not Hitler's storm, Nazi stormtroopers perform similar activities to what you were engaged in in Florida? Benz said, I wouldn't know that, Senator. Talmadge, you've read some history of that period, have you not? Correct. You read the rise and fall of the Third Reich, I take it? Correct. Are not the activities of the Nazi stormtroopers somewhat similar? I do not recall if he ever did or not. Talmadge, I thought they were. I read about a good many falsified documents during that era and libels and slander about the opposition. It was one of the ways, as I recall, that Adolf Hitler achieved power. Do you think Duke carried on his activities in an exemplary fashion in that manner, do you? And Ben says, yes, sir. And that Mr. Duke has been protected by the Senate so that the people in Florida, where he lives, or the Republican committee that hires him, does not expose him for being a Nazi stormtrooper. And some heads of the Republican Party are and were Nazi, Nazi war criminals. And there's been a drive to expose some of these people, but it has hardly begun. Now, the Department of Corrections in uh, California, there are links of Mr. E. Howard Hunt to all of this, and I'd like to run down a few of these because I think they're important. Uh, first of all, our CIA that's run by William Colby, from Vietnam, he came home from Vietnam, the Phoenix program, is absolutely identical to what the Ustazi were doing to Yugoslavia and what Reinhard Galen was doing in Germany before there was a full dictatorship. And I can't understand why the Senate passed with such uh, a large margin the approval of William Colby as the head of the CIA, knowing and even talking openly in the hearings about what went on in Vietnam. He was trained to rig elections. And these are the identical things. The man is in charge of all our intelligence in Washington. He's doing no differently than what the men did in Europe and two other countries that we know about. He, they, he was trained in rigging elections down there in terrorism, they were murdering the opposition, torture, violence, sabotage. They were doing this intelligence work in North Vietnam and to make it look like the other side was doing it, doing damage, turning people against each other. Mr. Kolb has been in the intelligence since the OSS days. 
this is his specialty and he was promoted to be in charge come over vietnam and the only reason he could be at the head now is to continue in the united states what happened in vietnam if his expertise is these black arts of sabotage he was brought home and that's why we're going to have so much terror and violence in this country one example of his agent from the cia who worked in the phoenix program in vietnam is colston westbrook who went right into our department of corrections to form the SLA and then he gets himself clean and backs out and leaves confusion among the radical and left. That's what the Eustasi did in Greece, that's what Galen did in Germany. This was their expertise. Then they were brought home to America and given millions of dollars to be trained and set around our cities and they're trained to break up groups so that the radicals in the Bay Area and all around the country are completely fractured and don't know which end is up or who to protect or who their heroes are. Now, money for the political assassinations of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King, I mentioned before, it came from the Permandex Foundation based in Montreal, Canada. The Eustace money, it seems, came from Canada also. Now, I'm not saying it's the same people, but I certainly think we should be writing to congressmen and asking them to investigate these matters. You can say, I've talked about them, and you want them checked out, that they should send some representative to see this research and check it out. There were people in Canada, Don Norton, David Ferry, flying down to Mexico City to deliver money. They stopped at Jamaica to deliver money to Guy Bannister and Clay Shaw in Mexico City and where E. Howard Hunt was the CIA case officer meeting with these people. Hunt was the case officer September, October of 63. And these men were working for the CIA and the money for that operation 11 years ago was coming down from Canada and money for the Eustasi is coming from Canada at the present time. And Mr. Kerbekovic, the, what we call him the Mad Bomber in Los Angeles, also came through Canada. Another connection of E. Howard Hunt, or possibly important to look up, is what I call the Spanish connection. Uh, the asylum for the hijackers and political assassins that left Sweden in 71 landed in Spain where they have famous attorneys and unlimited money. And they're put in special prisons. They're not in jails at all. E. Howard Hunt was in Spain for quite a while after the Kennedy assassination as a CIA officer and his wife, Mrs. Dorothy Hunt, until the Watergate uh, arrests, worked for the Spanish Embassy. There are men like William Harris of the SLA that were in Spain and other members of the SLA, uh, Colson Westbrook and Camilla Hall and Willie Wolf that traveled in Europe. And I asked in my Realist article, what countries did they go to? We have a right to know whether they knew each other before they met in the Berkeley area. Just as I have my suspicions after working many years on the Oswald people, it may be just the same identical pattern that it was at the time of the John Kennedy assassination, and I'd like to know what countries these SLA people were in, because Spain figures in with the Eustace, Howard Hunt, Dorothy Hunt, and William Harris for sure. So I'd like to know if the others were in Spain. Now the Nazi party comes into all of this in addition to incorporating Reinhard Galen's emigrate spies. Uh, Clay Shaw was part of the international Nazis from Italy and Germany since World War II. He was instrumental in bringing Reinhard Galen over, I understand. And he was meeting, as I say, in Mexico. Uh, Nazis were a very big part of the uh, trademark down in New Orleans and the various trademarks around the country uh, where they have met the international Nazis, not the uh, obvious ones with the armbands and the goose stepping, the World War II ones that have come to this country. Now, the ITT uh, offices in uh, Washington, D.C. were represented by Mullen Associates, a public relations office that E. Howard Hunt worked with, too. And it not only employed uh, E. Howard Hunt, they not only employed him there, but they were the offices for Howard Hughes and the ITT, and the ITT was made up of Nazis, the board of directors. Uh, I have information here we can go into about uh, Mr. Kurt von Schroeder and the SS raised money for Himmler. They brought massive armament contracts, the ITT. Fock Wolf Company made Nazi bombers by the ITT. All the Jews were fired, and after 1965, after the war, ITT got $27 million from you, tax dollars. Your taxes are going up this year. Tax dollars to compensate them for bombs that fell on their factory while they were making airplanes to, dam to damage Allied uh, troops. 
if that makes sense, I don't understand. We paid ITT this huge amount to resettle down in the West Indies to continue the work that they were doing, and they were supplying for Franco and for uh, Nazi Germany all through the war. The board of directors, a member of the Gestapo on the board of directors. Now, the ITT company moved into Chile. Uh, a former head of the CIA, McCone, was, was offering allegedly a million dollars to overthrow Allende. And all the news on Chile that you want is out front now. If you want to read the Washington Post, New York Times, and, and new things are coming out every day on that scandal. But the ITT was uh, big in Chile, and as soon as Allende was murdered, there was a news service, Earth News, March 17, 1974, saying Nazis are supporting the Chilean junta. Political repression is going on. There's 4,000 in concentration camps, Jewish names by the hundred, and the Chilean newspaper was running ads, a Jew will be hanging from every lamppost. E. Howard Hunt's name um, comes into the California prisons, as I say, because this same Yugoslavian uh, who has the alias of Zatko, his name is Rangel, said that he was given money that's in a bank by E. Howard Hunt, he alleges to murder Sirhan. And he is from Yugoslavia, brought over here under an assumed name, a typical espionage operation. Louis Takwa, the agent provocateur for the Los Angeles Police Department, said that he had the code name. Takwa alleges of Mr. White, and that was E. Howard Hunt, he said, and that Hunt was behind the martial law plans and the hiring of uh, radicals and bombing them, uh, blaming the radicals for violence that would take place in Miami. And when the, uh, it was supposed to take place in San Diego. When the convention was changed from San Diego to Miami, E. Howard Hunt was funding Segretti, who was funding members of the stormtrooper uh, like uh, Duke to do the same kind of violence down in San Diego. E. Howard Hunt's name comes through or associations running through history for the last 11 years. And maybe that explains to you why when the president had his troubles, the men of the Watergate arrest, the only man who gave them any trouble was E. Howard Hunt. The, the tapes that brought him out of the office were about hush money for E. Howard Hunt. That he won a million or more, he'd tell all the seemly things he did in the White House. Nixon said, Helms, he can take care of us. We've covered for him before, but what will we do with E. Howard Hunt? So Hunt is the, one of the most important men in the whole Watergate story. This story is wide open. It hasn't been properly investigated. And I think a man like that who is hiring people to do violence down in San Diego and then hiring members of the SS uh, to do violence in Miami, who was working for the ITT, he took his wig and was out visiting Dita Baird, so it shows he's working for the ITT out in Denver, Colorado. The ITT comes in in Chile, and then the Nazi signs go up. The ITT incorporated and worked with the Nazis all along. There is a link here between the terrorism of Nazi Germany the terrorism of the Ustasi, the incorporation of the Ustasi and, and Galen's men into the CIA, the use of William Colby, and the terrorism we're going to find. You have to work very hard and write to your congressman. I'll write articles. We've done two weeks on this. I'll be writing this subject, I think, will be the subject of my first uh, conspiracy newsletter or the next one that goes out for Paul Krasner because it's that important. Take care of yourself, and I'll see you next week. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for 10 years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KELRB FM in Carmel, California. Well, I think witchcraft has